very very good. Thank you so much for that introduction, Julie. And I just heard the notification that this is being recorded, which is great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining today. I really uh, appreciate you being here. Um, you know, years ago, if, if you told me this was happening and I'd be doing an event for the Bryant Library uh, for a book that I had just written, I really, I really wouldn't have believed you. So uh, it's a real honor to do this and a privilege um, you know, as Julie said, I, I did grow up in Roslyn. Uh, I have this sort of formative memories of the Bryan Library. I have very vague, almost like uh, watercolor images of what it's like in the children's area, circa 1988 <laughs> kind of thing. And then I have images of like going there to meet one of my teachers uh, in the summertime, doing this independent research project as a high school student. Uh, and, and, you know, I spent the first 18 years of my life in Roslyn, and then it just occurred to me that I've spent the last now 19 years of my life out of Roslyn. So it's this very strange uh, moment where I feel like uh, this thing that is very, uh, it's a part of me, um, but it's, it's getting further and further away. I, I say all of this uh, by way of just wanting to say thank you for having me, and it's a real privilege. Um, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about the journey leading to the book. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is that there are a lot of themes that run through the veins of, of Committed. Um, I'm going to pick out a couple of them, but a lot of them are informed by my life experience. It's, it's, a, it's a book that's meant to be uh, based on my life. Uh, it's, it's really, it's a memoir with the fictionalized components for privacy's sake, but um, my life wouldn't uh, the, the book would never have happened if the last few years of my life hadn't as happened as well. So what we're going to actually do is uh, is sort of do a, a very super brief overview of my journey toward the book. Then I'm going to read you a couple of sections and then we'll talk about them and, and answer any questions and open discussion up, which, which I really look forward to. Um, so uh, following uh, my experience in Roslyn, Oh, I shouldn't. I shouldn't jump ahead. My experience in that in the public school system was notable because it's the kind of place where there are just a ton of really smart people, high achieving people, kids of smart and high achieving people, um, and uh, I got. I don't want to say comfortable, but I certainly got used to the idea of working. Uh, achieving. Uh, let me let me phrase it that way. I was about to say working hard, and that's true, but I didn't really learn what hard work was in the way I think of it now until later. Um, and then from there, I, I, I you know, I, I was sort of like a, a straight, um, a good egg, I guess I would, I would call myself for the most part. And um, I uh, went to Brown University, uh, which is where my brother, my older brother had gone before me. Actually, he was a senior when I was a freshman, which was like a, a wonderful overlapping year uh, for our family. Um, and at Brown, uh, it was, it's probably what I think of as the most, um, where I felt most academically at home in my entire life, because there's everything is, is the world is your oyster at Brown University, where you can study what you, whatever you want to study, and you can do it however you sort of want to do it. And you're surrounded by intellectually curious people in as varied areas as you know one of my closest friends is a physicist and another might be a poet and you know everything in between uh, and the physicists might be a poet themselves and so you know the, it's a really really wonderful academic environment but I had to start working really hard just to get into medical school uh, which which I was able to do uh, you know um, I, I got into SUNY Upstate Medical University for those who don't know there are four SUNY medical schools. One of them is in Syracuse, New York, upstate, they call it. Uh, and one of them is in uh, Brooklyn, downstate. And that's where my brother went. Uh, and we ended up going the same years uh, because he took some time and I went straight through. So we tracked each other for a few years there, which was, which was really fun and interesting. Um, but when I got to medical school, things were really different. I couldn't skate by at all on intellect alone. That, that's not what med school's about. Um, for any doctors in the audience listening, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, smarts get you to med school maybe, but um, your ability to just sit and memorize and learn information and retain it long enough to do it to uh, 
for lack of a better word, regurgitate it to an exam and then and then learn how to do a skill and, and uh, do that over and over and over again. That's the fire hose of knowledge that you have to drink from to do well in medical school was something that that didn't come naturally to me. I had to cultivate that skill and even working as hard as I humanly possibly could. Uh, I probably was a, a middling student in at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Um, so I was really surprised and delighted, uh, but a little overwhelmed, more than a little overwhelmed, when at the end of medical school, I matched at Harvard. Harvard Medical School has uh, psychiatry residency training programs, and I matched into one. And um, it was shocking for lots of reasons. Uh, but one of the reasons it was shocking was that um, I was surrounded by mainly classmates coming from other Ivy League med schools, um, Harvard's and Yale's and Cornell's and Duke. And Duke's not an Ivy, but has an excellent medical school. All of these uh, things. And I had developed almost like an inferiority complex during my medical school training because, uh, again, it was sort of like this skill set that I struggled with. It just didn't come naturally to me. Um, and I looked around at my new classmates. There were 14 others in my class and thought the this group. Uh, you know, is as far from SUNY Upstate, which, by the way, was a wonderful place to study. Um, I, I like to say that, you know, studying medicine at SUNY Upstate got me all the way to Harvard to train, you know, and um, one of the things that's important to know is that you, you study in med school, you learn the foundational knowledge, but a lot of what the book is actually about is not about uh, knowledge, uh, the knowledge of psychiatry, for example, but actually the practice and learning how to be a psychiatrist and doing that when you're in your mid-20s, as I was. That's where a lot of the intrigue, I think, comes in with the book, because if you imagine uh, yourself at age 26, uh, let's say, which is what I was when I started psychiatry residency and where the book starts, um, what were you doing when you were 26? What were you up to? How did you spend your time? Who are your friends? Who are the important people in your life? When you think about those things, and then you compare that to um, what you find in the book committed, uh, it, it's really a striking comparison because in residency training, it's basically a tiny little group of people, 15 of us in our class, and you together, you're managing most of the psychiatric needs in this case for the medical center, a, a 600 plus bed medical center, and actually spread across two different uh, medical uh, systems. And, um, and so you're 15 people stuck together for four years, you have nothing in common besides this one match, excuse me, this one match uh, that came uh, through by way of an algorithm, a computer algorithm, algorithm that said, you're going to be here in Boston where you don't know anyone. Uh, and here you go, off you go, be a psychiatrist. So the book sort of starts out at that point. And very quickly, we learn, you know, that, that you learn how to be a doctor uh, on the job. Uh, and you do that both in regular medicine, internal medicine, uh, and you do that in psychiatry as well. Um, but what I want to do is really skip ahead now to the year 2018, because this informs a lot of uh, what I'm going to read to you and, and some one of the themes in particular that, that comes through in the book. And for anyone um, who would appreciate this, I'll just put a trigger warning here that I'm about to talk about serious illness, medical trauma, even the prospect of death and dying. And so if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, feel free to mute yourself or, or sign off or anything like that. Um, I hope you'll stay, but I understand if you don't. So in 2018, I was actually diagnosed with a serious uh, cancer, and that really changed the trajectory of my life. Um, at that moment in 2018, I was living in the suburbs. Uh, I, we, my wife and I had just bought a house. We had had our, uh, son, our first son uh, a year earlier. I had just been promoted to assistant professor. It was like um, things were just lining up on paper. It was a very perfect kind of setup. Uh, and then this asteroid just landed, you know, at our house uh, with this diagnosis that was like a lot of kidney cancers, largely asymptomatic, unable to be predicted. There was, there was nothing really um, anyone could have done. Uh, it, it just happened. But I found myself reevaluating my life. And one of the ways that I did that was by thinking, well, what happens now? What do I do now? I don't know 
how long I'm going to be living. I don't know what's going to happen. Thankfully, you should all know I'm doing really well. I just had scans that were really great scans. Uh, so that's good. So uh, you have to reevaluate your life and think, well, what's going to happen going forward? You know, how, how do I how do I live this life? Uh, and what I found that was uh, a phrase that I kept coming back to in writing in emails in my mind, the phrase was we go forward. And so I started going forward. And uh, one of the things that I found inspiring was the ability to write about my experience, because now I had the experience not only as a doctor, but also as a patient. And I thought, this is a way I can sort of process what I'm going through. I can write an essay about being a patient and a doctor and knowing the system and seeing all the cracks in the system and that kind of thing. So I started writing those essays. And I found that there was actually a, a sort of natural audience ready for it. There was uh, uh, sort of a, a receptiveness to those pieces without any good reason in my in my own head or experience doing this I would reach out to an editor and get something published in a place like uh, the Boston Globe or the New York Times or um, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine JAMA places that I had never published in before just on this topic of like uh, being a physician being a, a dad being a uh, patient all together, and really, frankly, just viewing all of that through the lens of being a human being. Um, but the we go forward phrase just stuck with me. And it, it's almost like I wanted to write that into every piece that I wrote. And one of those pieces that I wrote caught the attention of a literary agent and, and who, who reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to write a book? And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. Uh, so um, I'd always wanted to write a, a big book, you know, for a big publishing house and do the whole, do this kind of thing. Um, so it was just such an exciting time, but what what kind of book would, would I write? So we, we spent months passing back and forth this book proposal for, for the first couple of months. It was actually like a prescriptive book using the ideas, the lessons that I'd learned in the essays and you know whatever I could conjure together as sort of like a this is how I live my life now kind of a book and the agent just said that it, it's not that's not the story that's not uh the thing that we can sell and it's not the thing that you know that's been written there's a lot out there like that keep thinking you know and then one day it just occurred to me that I had lived this really interesting life uh in my psychiatric residency training and I could write a book that both explain to the reader, what's, how do you take a wide-eyed, naive, brand new doctor who doesn't really know how to do the job and turn them into a psychiatrist, someone who wears blazers uh, and uh, t-shirts underneath, uh, in my case, and grows a beard to look like a psychiatrist and that kind of thing. How do you do that? You know, people have all these ideas about like, what is a, what is a psychiatrist? Uh, it's one of the most risky things to answer when you're at a in the days when we had dinner parties, you know, like, uh, oh, you're a psychiatrist, are you going to analyze me? Are you going to uh, maybe people shy away or they start telling you their deepest, darkest secrets? And you're like, I'm off the clock, you know? Um, so anyway, I thought that would be an interesting book all by itself. But adding to that, that I met my wife during the, my training, uh, it became something that I said, I can write this book in a way that I think will be compelling at sort of an academic uh, scholarly kind of way. This is what it's like to be a psychiatric trainee and also at the same time provide a, a little bit of melodrama uh, to make it interesting. And so I think the tagline was something like um, um, com uh, uh, committed is like Grey's Anatomy meets one, uh, 1L, uh, L1, 1L, the, the book about law school, the first year of law school. Um, and that idea of like, you know, combining the intense social, uh, I don't know, misgiving, not misgivings, but adventures that the 15 of us had during those four years together, the intensity of those four years together, mixed in with the training of how do you become a psychiatrist, that's, that's the book. And when I came back to the agent with that idea, she said, that's great. You that's something that we can, that's a you turned what would be a small book into a, potentially like a big book, because that will be interesting to a lot of people. And I think uh, hopefully it is. Um, so that's where the book comes from. Um, what I wanna do is 
I'll pause here. Just if Julie, I see you on my screen. If you can give me a thumbs up, I can go on to, to read a couple of, of passages or if, okay, if you wanted to do something else or pause, we could do that. No, I just felt badly that I didn't introduce you with your bio. <laughs> so um, I could read that quickly now, or, or you can go ahead and read. It's up to you. I mean, sure. Yeah. What, whatever you like, honestly, whatever you like. Okay. I'm sure you know most of this, but um, I should have uh, mentioned this at the very beginning. So Adam Stern, MD, is a psychiatrist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He has written extensively about his experience as a physician, including in the New York Times, the Globe, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and the American Journal of Psychiatry and he lives with his family near Boston. So I apologize for the delay in that wonderful intro. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. And uh, this is a little window into my own narcissism that I covered that myself in my own talk, most of that stuff. So I appreciate uh, you saying so though. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just read a couple of passages. It'll just uh, be a few minutes in each one. Uh, and for anyone who has the book or wants to follow along, if you've got the, uh, the hardcover version, this is chapter 18, which is page 145. And um, this is about halfway, not quite halfway into the residency. Uh, I've just sort of started to gain my footing uh, and uh, a patient comes into my life uh, and the patient's name was Charlie. Charlie was a patient already in psychiatric treatment, but he was new to me. And I realized that neither of us wanted to be engaged in this evaluation. His choice of words had taken the decision out of our hands, though, as he had expressed what's known as conditional suicidal ideation, saying he would end his own life if the surgery revealed cancer. And it had, which meant that when he came to, he was met by a one-to-one -one sitter and a pink paper denoting that he was not free to leave, even a, a quote-unquote against medical advice. Before his operation, he had told one of the attending psychiatrists that he didn't think he had the stomach to die of cancer and would rather end it all while he was still able to. I assumed that the attending psychiatrist who had known the patient for years was home with her family, but she had left a note telling the surgical team that if the biopsy tissue revealed cancer, he should be emergently evaluated. I was paged to come see Charlie because I was the second year resident on call. Even though I'd never met this man, and even though I had little formal training in doing psychiatric consults on the medical wards at that point, it fell upon me to both figure out if he was truly a danger to himself and see if I could possibly offer some kind of therapeutic encounter. I would settle for doing only the former if that's all I could muster. After the interview, I was supposed to present the case to a senior resident by phone and the attending on call at home. This was a delicate dance among psychiatry residents, their supervisors, and our patients. Even when we made decisions in the room with a patient, we often had to clear them with a higher authority, so we tried not to make any promises in real time, lest we reveal ourselves to be the impotent underlings that we were. In this case, it also happened to be the middle of the night by the time he perked up enough to talk. And who the hell are you now? First, I've got this lady, he motioned. He said, motioning to one, uh, the one-to-one -one sitter. And now some Doogie Hauser MD comes in. What do you want, Doogie? I'm Adam Stern, Dr. Stern. Okay, Adam Stern, Dr. Stern, why are you here? Your surgical team asked me to come talk with you. You're not part of my surgical team? I shook my head. Then what kind of team are you from? And I just quick note, there's, uh, Charlie speaks with a lot of expletives. I'm going to do my best to sub them out. Uh, just because it, for me at the Bryant Library, it doesn't feel right to use swear words. So I'm just gonna uh, use other words, but um, I know you guys are a cool audience and would be fine with it otherwise, but just allow me this indulgence to, to try to bleep them out. All right, so um, then what kind of team are you from? Psychiatry. Oh my goodness, get out of here. I can't do that. I've been asked to assess you. Assess me, assess this, he said, making an bad motion. Um, I know you've had a difficult day. I don't want to take up any more of your time or energy than necessary, but I do need to evaluate you. Why is that? Well, before you went under, you told your psychiatrist, Dr. Glidden, I think. You think? Yeah, it was Glidden. 
you told her that if it was cancer, you would end your own life. A somber expression fell over his face, and immediately I knew that no one had told him yet. For goodness sake, indeed, I thought. It is. It's cancer. Damn. I'm not surprised. All the signs were there. I just... He began to sob into his, into his hands. They were heavy, deep, almost visceral wails, the likes of which I'd never heard before. I looked over to one, excuse me, I looked over to the one-to-one -one sitter as though she would know what to do, but she had her face in a newspaper. I felt the urge to put a hand on his shoulder or even hold him in my arms, but something held me back. Psychiatry is strange about physical contact with patients, in many cases for good reason, even when common sense and an empathic stance dictate that a hand be placed on a patient, residents are trained to be wary and think twice. I'm so sorry, I said quietly, almost whispering. He continued bellowing without relief. Finally, I overcame my programming and put a hand on his shoulder. Charlie was a big man in his, in his 60s. He reminded me of my father, and it felt out of character, but still right to be consoling him in this way. With the weight of my hand on his shoulder, he stopped crying, momentarily pulled back, and then leaned into it. He looked up at me. Thank you. I'm okay now. I leaned back in my chair and waited for him to speak. Cancer. What a cluster. My wife is going to kill me. She always told me to take better care of myself, drink less, exercise more. I just never really thought it would happen to me. Do you know the prog... Excuse me. Do you have any sense of the prognosis? I assume not, since no one's talked with you yet. Well, no, but... Also, there aren't a lot of good liver cancers, as I understand it. That's fair. Let me ask you something. What's the most important thing to you right now? How do you mean? Well, what we know is that you have liver cancer, and we don't know much else. That part's out of our control, though. I'd like to think with you about factors that may be under your control. Like what? He asked. Living as long as possible with a high quality of life? Preventing suffering? making sure that your family's taken care of, those kinds of things. I was really out of my depth, but it seemed like we were connecting. He talked about trips that he and his wife had put off for years, that maybe they would finally go on together. He spoke about living long enough to see his son get married. It sounds like you have a lot to live for. He nodded. That comment that you made to Dr. Glidden, I started. Forget it, he said. No, I can't forget it. My job is to take it seriously. You have good reason to feel that way, and I don't want to minimize that. But I do need to know if you're safe to be on your own right now. Today, I'm safe. I won't do anything yet. I'd been taught that this kind of contracting for safety is generally insufficient in a psychiatric risk assessment. He had a number of major risk factors for suicide in the context of a new diagnosis, including that his age was over 60. He was a male. My gut told me he wasn't going to act on the comment he had made. And that was also supported by his marital status and as being future oriented. I confirmed there were no guns in the home, though a simple rope can be just as lethal. He had no family history of suicide, which is a powerful factor in many cases. Are you going to send me to the loony bin? I don't think you belong there, I said. What do you think? He shook his head. I needed one more scrap, just one little thing that would put my decision to let him off suicide watch on more solid ground. I have to do some work here tomorrow morning. I should finish by about noon. Can I come back and see you before I head home? I'd like that. It wasn't in the textbook, but his willingness to acknowledge that he would be around the next day and allow me to visit made me feel more secure. Good, I will see you then. But I had forgotten one of the cardinal rules of overnight consults, which was to never promise anything before speaking to the attending. Tony Strand, our psycho farm teacher, was on that night. I presented the case and tried to convey all the points working in favor of lifting the suicide precautions. It's a tough call. I don't feel good about it, he said. Let's keep him on overnight and let Glidden comment in the morning. I think that's really going to throw this guy for a loop. I'm not sure if he'll ever trust another psychiatrist again, I said. For tonight, better safe than sorry. Good night. He hung up, and it was my job to return to Charlie's room and explained that his one-to-one -one sitter would be staying at least overnight. Who the heck does that guy think he is? It's my fault. 
I shouldn't have said anything until I knew for sure that we would be able to take down the precautions. He scoffed. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll still see you tomorrow, right? I asked. He nodded. Okay, try to get some rest between now and then. I exited the room with my shoulders slumped and made my way down the hall to the elevators. It was almost 3 a.m., and remarkably, I was caught up with work. I walked to the on-call room and sat at the desk. I watched the clock tick for two minutes before making my way to the bed. It would be two more hours before the bagel place around the corner opened for the day's business. My eyes closed for just what felt like just a moment, and I looked up to see the clock read 5.05 a.m. I jumped up and slid on my shoes. Essential caffeine and glorious complex carbohydrates awaited me. I'm just going to skip ahead to stay on this theme to page 153 in the middle. I coasted through my morning sign out and rounded on a few patients up on 4 South before circling back to check in on Charlie. I rode up the elevator, still glowing from my encounter with Jesse, when a woman with very tired eyes introduced herself to me. I'm Charlie's wife. You're the shrink? Oh, uh, yeah, I am the shrink, I guess. You guess? Did you talk to my husband Charlie last night or not? Y yeah, yes, yes, that was me, I stammered. I was nervous that she was going to slap me for keeping her husband hostage on a psychiatric hold without any right. I could kiss you, she finally said. Excuse me? Whatever you said to him really did something in that brain of his. He's been talking about offing himself if this was cancer for weeks, and now he's talking about wanting to fight this thing to the end. It was a bit surprising. I couldn't think of anything I said to him that could have made that difference. I think maybe he just needed someone to be in it with him for a bit when things were really bad. I was glad I could do that for Charlie. Me too. Thank you. We got off the elevator together and walked back to Charlie's room. He was sitting up in a chair, sipping coffee and reading a paper. I sat down with him and he told me about the box score from the Red Sox game the night before. Can't believe I missed this game, he said, shaking his head. He looked up at me. You look exhausted, kid. Are you free to go home yet or what? I nodded. Then get out of here already. I shook his hand and walked out the door. As was true for many consults, I left without knowing if I would ever see the patient again. I wondered how it would all turn out for him and hoped for the best. I'm going to pause there. Um, and I want to just say that uh, one of the things that I find important about that passage that I connect with, that I probably think about differently now than I would have if I tried to write this book before 2018, was that idea of committing to going forward, to just whatever lies ahead, to, to, to doing it, to going forward and uh, trying to experience it and trying to make the most of it. And so what I'll, what I'll do is uh, just tell you guys, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, that we do meet Charlie again later in the book. Uh, and he does go forward uh, as difficult and challenging as the rest of, of his life is going to be, he chooses to do that. And somewhere in there, looking back on my initial encounter with him, we, we end up uh, developing a bit of a relationship based on the, the few times that we meet. And uh, somewhere in there, I gained an appreciation that that maybe I had a positive influence on him, even though I didn't really know what I was doing in the moment, I knew enough to connect with him at a human level, at a basic person to person level. Uh, and, and that's one of the core tenets of the book to me. That's what, you, you know, I, I like to say that psychiatry is like 90% connecting with the person in front of you. And then the other 10% is great with medications, with therapeutic techniques. I do something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, this cutting edge brain stimulation technique. We've got all kinds of bells and whistles, but like none of it is going to do very much if you don't actually see the person in front of you for what they want, for what do they want out of their life? Who are they? What's important to them? And then align yourself with that. And I think I, I did that with Charlie. Um, and even as things progressed and got worse for him, I looked back with gratitude that we had made that connection and, and a feeling like even when things are bad and, and, and can get worse, that there can still be good in that. Uh, and, 
and that that is something that is another sort of skill that didn't come naturally that I had to cultivate the appreciation for value even when things aren't good. Uh, so what I want to do there is pause. I'll throw it to Julie and see if now is a good time to start uh, any answering any questions people have or discussion. Sure. Thank you, Adam. That was really very uh, poignant. And I remember that section of the book. Um, and I'm sure whoever has read it also remembers that section. Um, would anybody like to say something, ask Adam something about that or anything about the book? Um, now's a good time. You can just speak up. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Larry, you have to just unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. Uh, Adam, what I find so interesting is that when you come across a challenging patient like that, where you uh, you don't know whether he's being truthful or he's just, you know, placating you, uh, get out of here, you know, I'm done with you. And he'll like continue to think on his own frame of mind. And uh, for me, that would cause me, um, and I know I'm sure for you too, <laughs> like a constant reminder, a thought, like when you're not with the people who you are trying to make headway with, what really is going on with them? Like, uh, how can you trust anyone to be moving in a, a more healthy direction? Thanks, Larry. It's good, to see, it's good to see you, Larry. Um, I think that what you're getting at is one of the biggest challenges in psychiatry, which is, you know, that we have very few biomarkers. We don't have the um, uh, blood pressure cuff. Uh, right, no us, testing. Right. Um, so there are two competing principles at play in how a psychiatrist gets trained around this degree of uncertainty. One is that you have to take the patient at their word. Uh, so you have to be unafraid to ask the questions that you need the answers to, such as, are you planning to end your life? You know, that kind of thing initially makes people incredibly uncomfortable to ask. They think, oh, if I say it out loud, maybe that will push someone to do it, which is not the case. There's no evidence for that. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to be comfortable asking people. You need to largely take them at their word but you, as you, as you allude to, you can't, you can't let your guard down to um, the possibility of deception the, of uh, ulterior motives that sometimes people just don't want to be in the hospital, that they'll mm. say whatever they need mm. to say to get out of the hospital. <laughs> yeah. and, and so um, in psychiatry, we're trained, I actually went through it a little bit in, in probably one of the more dry uh, paragraphs in the book some of the factors that we think of as objective factors. So there are, there are modifiable risk factors, things like, well, do you have access to a gun? If so, can we remove that access uh, temporarily until you're feeling better? That kind of thing is a modifiable risk factor. Something that's not a mod modifiable risk factor, but it's real, I allude to as well. He has a serious illness. He's a male over the age of 60. Um, these are statistically make him more likely to attempt suicide. And that's why when I presented the case on paper to the attending in the scene, he's not comfortable letting the guy go because mm -hmm. he was looking at it objectively. And I was looking at it from what I had gained from a subjective uh, experience with the patient. So great question. And, and there's a lot to it. Thank you. I think uh, Malus, am I pronouncing that right? You have a question? You just have to unmute yourself. Yeah. I don't know, you're still muted. Okay, um, my point is like, as we know, medicine is arts and science. And going through your book, I see the science is what's in the book, but you have the art, you're applying it, science, you know how to apply it, the art part of it to your patient. And that is what's most important. It's not what's in the book. Probably you're the attending, you're attending when he's looking subjectively. Objectively, he is like, and he's not happy, very happy or very comfortable. He's looking what the book says, but you are applying your art into how you connected with this patient. And I think it's very important that how you connect, 
and your, how you applying your art part into this issue or the others. And that's genius of you. Thank you very much, Malus. Dr. Malavi, really, um, I appreciate that. You know, it's, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah. Of course, you know, that pr the practice of medicine is all about the art of applying the science, right? It's, it's right. this convoluted thing that exists between humanity and science. And, um, you know, the, the people that exist around their biology, right? Uh, and especially psychiatry, but really, like you get at, it's in every field, right? There is a, a person on the other end of the exam room, you know, in every field that you need to worry about first and try to figure out how to connect with that person or, or align with them toward certain uh, common goals. So I thank you. I appreciate that. Um, would anybody else like to add or ask a question? Um, I want, oh, Bonnie, was, did you have your, oh, no, wait. Did you want to say something? No. Okay, Evelyn, you have your hand up. Just unmute yourself, Evelyn, please. Where'd she go? Oh, she's still muted. I oh, see it. Evelyn, do you know how to unmute? I don't know. Does she hear? Evelyn, oh, I just, <laughs> just unmuted myself. Um, could you talk about Jane and Oren? And because it struck me that sometimes you have to deal with situations where there's nothing that you can do. And that must be so difficult. And the other comment that I had was that I, at the beginning, I really appreciated your openness about your insecurities and your self-doubt. And I thought that was refreshing. And so when you saw the evolution of, you know, through the book, it was good. Thank you very much uh, for that last part. I appreciate that. Um, one of the challenges in writing, and if I can step back and talk about the process just a little bit about writing the book is like every, almost everyone in the book needs to have an arc, you know, including me, uh, primarily me, the most important character uh, of a memoir is like the, is the person, right? And so um, it's a story from my life and it's true to form. I think I did develop over those four years in this way. Um, and, but one of the most challenging parts of the book is, is it's not like a journal entry kind of thing. And it's not fiction where I can just totally make things up and, you know, it's, it's somewhere between there where I had to create this arc of uh, personal development that I really did experience in real life, but then make it palatable to the reader. Right. So I, I really appreciate you saying that you asked me to touch base on Jane and Oren, uh, which I'll, I'll do uh, briefly for each. So Jane, is a character in the book uh, um, that uh, is diagnosed with um, anorexia nervosa, a very severe case of anorexia nervosa, which is a very severe illness for many people, not for everyone, but for a great uh, degree of patients with that diagnosis, it can be lethal. It can, there, you know, there's a high mortality rate. Um, I learned this uh, originally from my family friend, uh, Dr. Stanley Hertz, uh, who is a child psychiatrist in Roslyn. Um, uh, and uh, he, when I was uh, 19 years old, he let me uh, volunteer on the, as a sort of summer job uh, kind of thing on the uh, eating disorders unit. It's just an, an incredibly severe uh, disorder when it's bad. Um, and what made Jane's character so interesting, and I, I hope and think compelling, is that She's been in the system for so long. She's a, an incredibly bright person, which is very common among people with anorexia. She's um, high achieving. She's out of school because of the disorder, but otherwise would be at, at, you know, at, at a very um, um, prestigious school. And she, she can control uh, aspects of her life, but she can't, she can't, she knows this, the, at, at its most basic level that the solution is good nutrition uh to her health but she cannot do it she can't do it with all of the resources of the medical center she can't do it with the legal system saying here is an order for you to have a feeding tube in the um i i, I won't uh, actually give any spoilers about how jane's story concludes in the book but i will say that she gets worse over time and th that was another example of feeling powerless in the moment and only upon reflection, really identifying that there can be value in even when there are bad outcomes. And if you think about other medical doctors uh, that are practicing other forms of medicine, 
um, you know, uh, just as because we have them in the family, I'll cite cardiology. Um, you know, patients who see cardiologists, they're put on uh, blood pressure medications, uh, they're put on cholesterol medications, they might have procedures on their heart. Um, sometimes I would even go as far as to say, always, eventually, uh, the body breaks down and there are negative, quote unquote, negative outcomes, which in medicine speak just means the uh, continuation of, of human health deteriorating over time. And so it's in psychiatry, it's different because it's not really like age dependent and it's hard to define. And so Jane's case is an example where on the surface, it feels like we should be able to help this person, but because we can't, we don't have a good enough treatment for every patient with this disorder, we can't we, we can't do it. She, she gets worse every time I see her uh, in, in various ways. And so learning to even, even in, in a similar way, as, as I described with Charlie, finding value where it seems like there's none is one of the themes with Jane. And again, being in the experience with her and holding, holding those emotions with her provided some of that value. And then very briefly on Oren. Oren exists later in the book when I'm doing outpatient um, psychiatry. And he's a patient with a clear degree of paranoia and he won't take any medications for this. And um, the lesson that comes through with Oren that I learned from one of my mentors um, uh, in the book, uh, he's Dr. McQueen, I believe. Um, and the lesson is that even, you know, that we're, we're not just people who can prescribe medicine, that even in what was a psychopharm clinic, uh, even though the patient wasn't taking any psychopharmacologic medications, again, there was value because him coming even just once a month, which is not like a regular therapy, and in, even coming for just half an hour, which again, is not like a regular psychotherapy, that was one outlet for him to exist, to be himself, to feel not judged by his paranoia, to talk openly about what he was going through. And it wasn't until I pushed him further because I was worried about him, did that relationship rupture. Uh, and and um, that's something that's a very difficult lesson too. There are, a lot, there are several lessons in that one case, one of which is that sometimes you end up in a situation where you cannot continue to, to work with a patient, not because you're unwilling, but because uh, the patient, you are unable to connect, uh, to continue that connection. So those of you who have read the chapter understand what, ha what happens with Oren. Thank you for that question. Or comment on the book or anything else? I'm looking for Hello. Okay. Uh, I want to just ask from a different perspective as a writer, uh, not a doctor. I, I do have a PhD, but in English. Uh, and I'm basically a writer. Uh, in just listening to that s selection you read, uh, I can see that the narrative is fictional, not just in privacy, but in using fictional techniques in the sense that you have dialogue and then you have internal monologue where you are reflecting on it. Um, and um, you're also giving different time shifts, uh, different time perspectives. I, I wonder about your process of writing the book uh, and what happened with the editor in terms of uh, possibly some of these uh, devices that I've, I've just mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question because you're 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 right on that. My job, what what I saw as my job, and what my editor uh, conveyed to me was my job was to write a compelling story uh, that did use those techniques uh, because it involves the reader in the emotions of the moment, right? And like I said earlier, like I I wasn't I wasn't aiming to uh, provide a historical account. Uh, you know, you, uh, if if I put together a book of people's medical records and, you know, things, uh, recorded sessions, things like that, it would be incredibly dry reading. We, we wouldn't uh, be having this meeting probably. Um, so I did rely a lot on literary technique. Um, some of that comes naturally. Some of it came uh, by way of the editor's suggestions, 
before writing the book, I did a lot of investigation into other medical memoirs where there's a lot of this kind of thing. Uh, and there are techniques both to uh, private, you know, anonymize interactions. Uh, I say right up front in the author's note about some details have been deliberately changed. And then, you know, one of the ideas that the editor conveyed to me that I think is important is, look, this is your recollection of how these things went. That's baked into the book. Like, in other words, that's what this book is, is your recollection. So I have 14 classmates. If they each wrote a similar thing, I can't imagine how different some of their perspectives might be. Um, but, you know, that's for them to write if they choose to, you know. So, so I think that um, you're absolutely right. I have taken uh, literary techniques and applied them to what I recall events being like. And then I've even gone a step further to, you know, when I've needed to fictionalize something for privacy, I have. A lot of names are changed. Uh, there are composite characters. People have been smushed together in an amalgam uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, names and locations and times, thing, anything that really would make it identifiable has been, has been altered. But really to your point about the writing style, that's intentional because if someone says to me, it reads like a novel, again, I take that as a, as a huge compliment. So I'll, I'll say thank you for that question and comment. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Adam. Uh, anyone, any other questions? We have a, just a few more minutes. Just one more comment, please. Uh, I'm not a physician, but reading the book, I found it super interesting to go through the years and um, especially, you know, like working in most of a day, you know, like 23 out of 24 hours a day on the job, learning, growing, moving, uh, meeting responsibilities that are assigned to you. Uh, I didn't do a residency, but I know, and then plus a fellowship after that normally follows. It's like a big commitment of time and effort and your personal life becomes totally down there while your work focus is primary. And um, to be able to get through it, uh, I found that uh, as the book progressed, um, I felt like I was moving along the sequence of the residency four-year interval. And I liked it. I thought it was really um, educational for me. And I could identify with it, even though I didn't do it. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. It's, good. it's good to see you, Larry. And um, <laughs> I think you're, you're even sort of uh, emphasizing Bob's point, which I appreciate, which is like, there's an arc, you know, you, you, there's, and, and that happened. And it's part of the journey of training, right? Is, is you come in not knowing how to do the job and somehow by the end of four years, you hopefully do know how to do yeah. the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. I, yeah. And she's just muted. So maybe we can wait for her to unmute. Muted, Barbara. Make the trouble finding easier to find unmute. It's building okay. tension for the question. Okay, Barbara, we're ready. Is it is it there? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Uh, I found you totally inspirational because I'm a therapist and I work with many psychiatrists. And uh, I think you've probably heard of Irvin Yalom who is one of my idols. And you remind me of a young Irvin Yalom. And he inspired me to get into this. And I hate to say it, but so many psychiatrists have, are, have become medical managers. They don't have this empathy and this caring and, or they don't choose to use it or whatever. I don't know what happens. But all I know is that it's just been wonderful listening to you. It really has, and I, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, if I can maybe comment on that um, phenomenon. First of all, thank you for the work you're, you do, because I, I do look at there people who do therapy. It's much harder than than a lot of the psychopharm stuff that psychiatrists very often end up doing. And I still do a touch of therapy here and there in my private practice and and it's hard you know it's and so to do that entirely uh I, I admire people who are therapists a great deal and i appreciate what you said um 
I think that society has incent. I, I don't want to uh, defer. Um, I don't know responsibility on what you've brought up because it's a real thing. It's a real issue that a lot of people feel. So I want. I want. I do want to uh, validate that feeling, and I feel it too. But I've felt it from this perspective of like society will sort of incentivize psychiatrists to see the most patients uh, in a short period of time that they can because society has said psychiatrists are the ones who can prescribe these medications. Um, and, and there might be, there is very good reason for that. You know, these are not, a lot of the medications are not um, to be trifled with. They're, they're, they have serious side effects and you need an MD or a DO or another uh, high, high, an NP. You need a, a degree in training. Really what I'm trying to say is appropriate training to be able to prescribe these things. But as soon as we get into a fee-for-service model, which is what we're mostly stuck with in this country, where people make a living by seeing volume, then as soon as that happens, you have a problem. And so I think that it's very hard to connect with people when you uh, aren't in an environment to be able to connect with them. So you have to go out as a psychiatrist, I'll just talk about myself. I have to go out of my way if I want to see patients for an hour, let's say. Uh, and where I do that is in my private practice, which is tiny. I, at this point, just a few patients uh, remain in my private practice. So it's, you have to go out of your way to do it. And so I, again, it's as I, I, what I want to say is we should do better as a society. We should design the system so that it doesn't incentivize psychiatrists uh, to practice in, in a, in a way that's just, you know, um, as you're describing. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one last question, Adam. Uh, is there anybody, anybody have anything else? Um, one thing I wanted to point out is there's a, a journal that librarians use to purchase uh, materials and books, and it's called Kirkus. And Kirkus uh, put at the top of their review of Adam's book, this phrase, engrossing, indelible, and brimming with genuine humanity. And um, when I saw that, I, I felt, wow, they really got it right. And, um, and it kind of takes into account what Bob said earlier about using literary techniques. Um, it was engrossing. And you, know, you put it on the page, and you want, made people want to really read it and continue reading it. Indelible, you know, I think you've made a mark on all of us in many ways, not just the book, but your presence here today. And the genuine humanity, I mean, I don't know how, if everyone else felt this way, but when I read this book, your humanity like really came off the page um, from when you said a few times about how you, you didn't you really didn't want to commit people against their will. Um, that, that struck me like completely, you really cared and it, it's, it's clear. Um, I don't know if there's a question in all of that, except that, um, do you think Kirk has got it right? And what do you hope readers, <laughs> what do you hope readers will get, will glean from your book and take away? Uh, you know, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but I, I hope readers will have an appreciation for the journey that, you know, psychiatric trainees go through, that all medical trainees go through, but more than that, 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 you know, they know what to look for in, in, a, in anyone who's thinking about going into mental health, anyone who's thinking about going into any kind of clinical or academic field, you know, th there are elements in the book of humanity that I think people will connect with. That's what I hope first and foremost. And then beyond that, I hope, you know, that people learn just as uh, the, the last person who asked a question said, you know, that, that connecting with people is like the most important thing. And then everything else is built on top of that. Uh, and then I hope people have a good time reading the book and feel, feel things. I hope people tear up. I hope they uh, feel sad when it's over. You know, that's what I'm going for. So, um, so far from that perspective, I think Kirk has got it just right. Mm -hmm. I, uh, but, you know, I, I appreciate, I, I become, um, I don't know, praise, praise sometimes makes me un, uneasy, but I appreciate how they, how they framed it. It's a, a really high praise. Mm, thank you. Um, thanks for that response. Um, and again, one last moment. I don't want to take more of your time, Adam. We appreciate that you were able to be with us today. Um, oh, are you writing anything else? Do you have another book coming out? 
I don't yet have another book coming out, so uh, you, you'll you'll uh, you'll know as soon as I know. But I don't have anything uh, coming out at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Well, again, thank you. Thanks for being here. Take care of yourself. We're happy to hear that you're doing well. Yes. Best wishes to you. Thank you. Yes. Best wishes to you. And um, this was a really wonderful experience. So I think I speak for all of us when I say that. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs>